Hi, I am. So, my name is Robert Mulvar. I'm the author of this book, The Memoirs of a Beautiful Boy, and I'm just so um, I'm so honored to be here. I have to tell you, I have gotten to speak to a few similar groups as I've, as I've traveled around the country, and you know, um, I am not that old. Yeah, I am. I'm 30, um, and. Um, <laughs> Uh, and um, I have to tell you how remarkable this is to me because I was in high school just a little over 10 years ago and in the part of Texas I grew up in, I mean this would have just been so impossible to have an amazing supportive group like this and um, I mean lots of parts of Texas are really sophisticated and advanced but not where I grew up and it this would have just made all the difference in the world. And I was thinking about what sort of support, I mean, I have the sort of mixed blessing of being so obviously gay that um, coming out was sort of never an issue for me. And I, and I was the only sort of obviously gay, and I was thinking of this one lovely, lovely teacher I had who saw the difficulty that I was having and she gave me a picture of Judy Garland. <laughs> you know, and that was her little sort of postcard to me to sort of, you know, say she was with me. But I think back on that, and it's so sort of quaint and sweet. And now I don't think, you know, gay kids would even know who Judy Garland was, you know? So that was the last moment of that, too. Anyway, I'm gonna, I'm gonna read something. Um, very short, and um, in my book is sort of a comedy about growing up gay in East Texas, and also a comedy about my um, my parents' divorce. So this has this has a little. I think it touches on both subjects. Okay, uh, counteracting all the cold quarter I absorbed <laughs> at my grandmother's house was among my father's principal reasons for beginning my boxing training when I was six years old. <laughs> He'd been a Golden Gloves champion, the Fighting Irish, they called him in the ring. His robe and trunks were made of green satin with applique shamrocks, and I don't believe that my grandfather, Papa, who carried spare boxing gloves <laughs> behind the seat of his truck throughout my father's childhood so that Daddy might wallop willing vagrants on the side of the road <laughs> ever forgave my mother for putting an end to my father's boxing when they first started dating at Texas A&M. <laughs> but on this issue, among many, mother didn't care what Papa thought, since she believed boxing to be the first step down a short road toward becoming a white trash weirdo. <laughs> a claim later substantiated by the fate of my cousin Willie who, by the time I was 16, had been successfully trained by Papa and lived in the woods and bred raccoons for a living. <laughs> I got a mama coon, he told me. I got a dad coon. <laughs> Pretty soon, they're going to make me some baby coons. So when Papa and Daddy put me in training, they made me swear not to breathe a word of it to mother, which, despite my mortal terror, I agreed to because Papa had found and met my price. I was a pony whore. <laughs> Papa promised that if I fought Tito, the Mexican stable boy whose family lived in one of the service apartments behind the barns, and who often rode with me wearing my cast off clothing, in our improvised merry-go-round, <laughs> feed buckets hung from the electric horse walker, that a blonde Shetland pony would be mine. So, in the early mornings, while Mother was still sleeping, I trained with Papa, running laps in the copper-red dirt of the horse barns. Tito, however, did not require athletic training because his whole young life had been spent in flagrant violation of child labor legislation, cleaning stalls and raking shavings, and no matter how thoroughly I had absorbed the closest thing my grandfather had to a mantra, Irishmen don't say ouch. <laughs> I was certain that like most of the poor, Tito could beat the bejesus out of me. But even still, I kept my mouth shut and my mind on the pony 
because Papa guaranteed me that it didn't matter how pathetically I performed in the fight, as long as I stepped into the ring with Chicho, and as long as I didn't cry or slap like a girl, he'd live up to our bargain. Which gave me an idea, resting largely on a skill I'd picked up with Mother while watching the Channel 13 3 o'clock million dollar movie. So, on the morning of our fight, when Papa and Daddy crowded the brooms and fur air around a blank patch of coppery dirt in a corner of the barn, and Tito charged forward to take his first swing at me, I swooned. <laughs> I wafted, limp as a petal from the bloom, with a hand to my brow like I'd seen Betty Davis do. <laughs> it was my final moment of believing fainting to be one of those talents from the movies that people might really be impressed by, like singing operetta or tap dancing. An idea I was cruelly dissuaded from when, after a moment of dead quiet, Daddy started nudging my prone body with the toe of his boot, and Papa started slapping Daddy with his stetson, and Tito looked genuinely perplexed. <laughs> and I came to the sudden realization that nobody was buying me a pony. <laughs> At which point, I revealed the whole foul scheme to Mother, who, taking my face in her hands, assured me that Papa would be buying me. <laughs> For two glorious months after Prince was delivered to me dressed in a red ribbon halter, I rode him across Papa's pastures until he was fried like rice under a pecan tree during a lightning storm. Oh. <laughs> the next morning, as Mother and I watched one of Papa's grooms hitch Prince to the back of the tractor with a steel cable and drag his stiff little corpse by his hind legs into the tall grass behind the racetrack, she asked me, do you want Papa to buy you another pony? <laughs> Mother crouched down to me, her high heels sinking into the red dirt of the pasture. No, I said. Probably wise, Mother answered. It's best to let the worst go.